First, I want to thank Dan for coming in. Uh, PayPal is a very big position for Action Alerts Plus, uh, has been for some time. Uh, and we are in it because we think that Dan is a visionary and his team is unbelievable. Thank you, Jim. And I'm proud to have been out to your place a couple times. Yep. Uh, and I want to, want to start by something a little bit ethereal, which is uh, you embody something that we didn't think was really possible, which is the democratization of money. No one talks about it. No leaders talk about it. But it's central to your ethos. And I think if you explain that to people, you might know why we think of the world of PayPal. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, and it's a pleasure to be in front of everybody. Um, so when we talk about uh, the democratization of money, um, there's a saying um, that it's expensive to be poor. Uh, and unfortunately, that's very true in financial services. Um, if you're outside of the financial ecosystem, uh, it costs you a tremendous amount of money just to do basic transactions. You cash a check, costs two to five percent. To send a bill can cost you eleven dollars to just pay a cable bill. You stand in line for thirty to forty-five minutes, and um, it can cost up to ten percent of somebody's disposable income just on unnecessary fees and interest rates. Um, and so uh, we think that's ridiculous with technology. We think that technology, software platforms, the fact that everybody's got a mobile phone right now, which is all the power of a bank branch in the palm of their hands, that you ought to be able to do those transactions more securely, faster, more efficiently, uh, less cost. and. It's a gigantic opportunity. There are over 70 million adults in the US that are outside the financial system. Uh, something like two thirds of all Americans uh, struggle to make ends meet at the end of the month. Um, over two billion people in the world outside of that. And so we think there are two things we can do as a uh, tech, uh, FinTech company. One is we can connect those consumers into the digital economy, uh, give them the opportunities afforded by that. And number two, and you heard a lot about this on the last panel, is retail is going through a fundamental change right now. Everything moving towards digital. And we ought to be able to um, democratize capabilities for retailers in order to compete in the mobile um, uh, uh, retail era that's coming up. So to us, it's a gigantic opportunity. And I think we're well suited to, uh, to provide it. OK, so that ethos. How does it play into the role of a, a moat? Because uh, Bank of America could be here, Wells Fargo could be here, and listen to you and say, you know what, we're going to be in the democratization game. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they, I, they absolutely could say that. Um, and, um, and I think um, what's happened recently um, is we've opened our platform to be this open platform. We used to be really kind of a payments button. We're now an open digital platform. Our goal is to be the world's largest open digital payments platform. Um, and as a result of that, we're starting to team with Wells Fargo, B of A, JP Morgan Chase, Santander, um, Barclays, uh, uh, you name it, the largest banks and financial institutions around the world to basically take the best of each of our value propositions, put them together, and offer something unique to consumers and merchants that we couldn't do alone. And that partnering and that open platform is really, I think, if you think about it, what's really taken our growth and accelerated it. I mean, we grow our, our processing volume now on average 30% plus every single quarter. Now, uh, repeatedly, before each one of those, uh, well, a lot of the, the large domestic banks, uh, we heard that you were going to be defeated. You'd be defeated by Visa. You're going to be destroyed by Wells Fargo. JP Morgan was going to get you. I mean, what happened that people didn't see your vision coming? Well, I think, um, uh, first of all, we try to just let our results um, speak for themselves as opposed to prognosticating about uh, what might be. Um, I feel uncomfortable doing that in general. Right. Um, and I like uh, 
just sort of executing on a very consistent basis around that. But I think the biggest thing that happened um, for us is um, people thought we were going to be competing against everybody. Right. Um, and what we did is uh, we basically made two big strategic decisions inside the company, both of them controversial at the time. First, we opened up um, to all of our consumers. And as you know, we have almost 240 million people who use the platform now around the world. Um, and we used to um, steer those consumers um, to lower cost funding options. And basically what we thought is if we want to build a great enduring company over the long term, you actually have to give customers a choice. Uh, every single transaction, allow them to pick and choose exactly what financial instrument they want to use to pay for that transaction. A lot of people thought that that was going to really hurt our margins. Mm -hmm. The day we announced that deal, our stock price went down 9%. Um, Within four hours, one of the headlines was, you know, Shulman's strategy called into question. Um, and I thought, well, it's a strategy. It typically takes longer than four hours uh, to play out. Um, but OK. Um, so and, and really what we saw and what we knew would happen. I mean, we, we do have the advantage of being a tech company. We do 30,000 software releases a quarter. So we test everything on A-B testing constantly. We take 1% of our traffic, we see what will happen with that, we do multiple tests, and then we roll things out into 3% of the traffic, 5%, then if it's going well, we can, we can go move forward. And what we saw with that choice is calls into customer service went down dramatically. In fact, our calls into our customer service, even though we've put on something like 60 million incremental net new actives, our transactions uh, have grown by multiple billions. Our calls into our customer service are lower now than they were three years ago. Um, the amount of engagement that our consumers are doing has accelerated uh, pretty dramatically. And that move to choice just unleashed a great new value proposition. Our net new actives are up over 50% year over year uh, last year. Um, and so not only did we open up the value proposition to consumers, but because we weren't steering to an instrument, mm -hmm. all the banks and financial networks all of a sudden realized that PayPal could be the biggest and most important digital distribution channel for them. And so they went from being what I think a lot of people thought um, and called it frenemies, right. with more of the accent on the enemies, uh, piece of it than the fra, um, and really went into allies. Um, and we now are working extraordinarily closely with um, each one of those financial institutions because we are driving double digit percentage increases in volumes to every one of them. Now, one thing that you've done, and you're quite modest about it, but I've been to your headquarters, so I know uh, you have a, the ethos, you live it, you don't just talk about it. I listened to uh, what you said about 30,000 releases. I think about the fact that when you say FinTech, you really do have amazing people. I have to believe that it's your ethos. I also have to believe because you're a leader in diversity, you are attracting the smartest people because that's what the young, smart people really care about. Yeah, I think um, at least out uh, in the Valley where there's a tremendous war uh, for talent, um, people want to work at a place that's trying to make a difference uh, in the world. Um, and I think we're really fortunate that we're in the position to make a real difference in the world. I mean, you look at um, our working capital uh, for small businesses. We just announced that we've, uh, since our inception, lent uh, some $5 billion to small businesses, over 150,000 of them. I think we're probably one of the top five lenders of working capital now uh, to small businesses. Here's two facts that I love. 25% of our working capital loans are to the 3% of counties in the US where 10 or more banks have closed branches. And where do banks close branches? They close branches in neighborhoods where the medium income 
is below the national average. And so we are actually performing a service for those small businesses that they just couldn't have gotten other, where, other, other places. The other very important fact is when we loan to a small business, their average sales go up 22% versus a control group that go up 1% to 2%. So we're making a real difference in those neighborhoods. And it's disproportionate to underrepresented minorities, to women-owned businesses. And people feel great about that. But the other thing that I think is really important is we have a very inclusive mission, right? It's to democratize financial services that managing and moving money should be a right for every citizen and not a privilege for just the affluent. And that's very inclusive. And that means that every part of PayPal has to represent that mission. So you look at our board. When I came on, our board was 10% diverse. Four years later, we're now 45% diverse uh, on our board. You look at our uh, director plus team, so director, senior directors, vice presidents, we're now 37% diverse in that. So almost twice what the Valley is. And we have a goal, I'm not sure we'll get to it this year, but to be 40% diverse by the end of this year on our leadership team. 44% uh, of our company are women, 51% uh, uh, are uh, white males. Um, and so we are really trying to uh, live our values. And you saw this when we, um, uh, one of the things that we were really in the newspaper for, the thing that I got uh, multiple death threats uh, on, um, which is why I sit so close to you, Jim, so I can <laughs> hide behind you in case uh, I see anybody stand up, um, uh, is we pulled out of North Carolina uh, when HB2 uh, was announced. HB2 was a bill that, um, and I read it uh, forward and backwards, uh, that allowed for the discrimination uh, against somebody for their sexual identity or sexual orientation. We had just announced a, we were going to put in a 400-person uh, operations center, uh, really compliance operations center there. And we pulled out of North Carolina um, because it was inconsistent with our values. And so, and by the way, it was lonely for a while. And, mm -hmm. you know, I did get quite a number of... Uh, very creative death threats. Um, I tried to hire some of them for our marketing. Um, uh, they really are quite creative uh, in their descriptions. Um, but I think living your values, um, not just having them hang on a wall, I've found is way more important than I ever gave credence to when I was younger and growing up. Mm -hmm. Before, it was all hard metrics, um, and I'm still a very operationally focused uh, CEO. You can ask me almost any number, and I'm pretty sure I'll know it. Um, but values are what guide your decisions. And there is no way in today's world that you can avoid the cultural wars that are going on. There's no way when you know uh, Charlottesville happened um, and uh, you know there were uh, Nazi and Nazi sympathizers and um, you know, we have a acceptable use policy that we don't accept uh, PayPal at sites that promote hatred or incite violence. And um, so, you know, we have to be involved in First Amendment types mm -hmm. of things. Like, where does hatred start in free speech? And it's, a, it's actually tricky. Um, there's no fine line on it. Like, everybody says, well, it's free speech, but you can't yell fire in a crowded right. theater. Um, so we have to make some of these decisions. And you know, we make some decisions, and not everybody's happy about it. But um, we try to be very true to our acceptable use policy and to our values. And that allows us to attract some of the very best talent. Also, the fact that we've upgraded our tech uh, stack, and we, have, you know, we can get the best developers now. We have state-of-the-art uh, JavaScripts that we can uh, uh, develop in. So, you combine a number of things together, and uh, the talent that now is coming to PayPal is, is very impressive. Facebook and Alphabet, uh, to some degree, did not share those values that you had because I think they think they got in the way, uh, or they felt like it wasn't something in the workplace. Uh, are they going to follow you, or do you think they just it's not in their DNA? 
Um, I, I try not to talk for any other company but PayPal um, because I'm not there. Um, but I do know those CEOs quite well. I do know that they care deeply really? about the thing. They do care deeply about it. Um, you know, they, um, they're in very different industries than we are right. as well. Very different. We're in the financial services industry. I mean, we, we're regulated across. Right, you're not selling people's Yeah, yeah we're regulated across 200 countries around the world. Um, we have been in the compliance and risk management business. Um, you know, and I've added literally hundreds of millions of dollars uh, of cost to bolster our compliance and risk management so that it can be state of the art, best in class, because I think that's essential because one, regulations evolve all the time. Uh, GDPR is a one, you know, in Europe that's happening with privacy. Um, and, um, but we work with regulators because regulators turn to PayPal. You know, we're one of the, you know, top three fintech companies in the world. The other two are in China. Um, and so in the Western world, we're the leading fintech uh, player by, by a lot. And regulators basically want to work with us to e reimagine what the financial system could be in a world of mobile, in a world of software platforms, of internet connectivity, so that you can bring more financial inclusion and financial health to citizens. And they're willing to open up sandboxes for us to experiment in. Um, and so I think we just have a different um, history right. than some of those other companies. But um, I think every one of those companies, whether they started that way or understand it now, um, that uh, leading by values, um, I just think it's absolutely essential for long-term success. In international. I mean, for instance, I listened to you in India. That would be what people are looking for, values, right? I mean, some of these systems do not, they don't want uh, cowboys. They want people with values in, uh, overseas. Even though I'm wearing cowboy boots? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I think India is one of the most fascinating countries in the world. I would have thought five years ago, India would be one of the last right. to move from cash. I mean, it's a cash-oriented uh, society. It's a, the largest democracy in the world and one of the really messiest democracies in the world, really infrastructure that is difficult over there. And they have basically the government there, I think is put into place one of the more audacious plans uh, from top to bottom. They've, in fact, almost created a whole software stack to move the entire population uh, to digital payments from biometric identity, right. Adahar, to certain types of bank accounts that are uh, just for the very underserved. And they are pushing hard uh, to move that entire society over to digital payments. And look, I mean, I'm seeing that across the world right now. You go to right. China, some of the people here were talking about retailers and uh, mm -hmm. what's happening. Go to China. Go to China and see what's happening in the retail environment over there, and you will see what the future looks like. This whole idea about not buying food. Like, right. They all buy food in their groceries, and it's delivered and cooked within 30 minutes to the home. Now, they have density in cities and different things, um, but it is... Um, it's eye-opening to see what's happening over there. And for us, PayPal, every region of the world, whether it's North America, EMEA, uh, APAC, is growing 20% plus just with the explosion of digital payments. Do you think that 10 years from now, the United States will be as big as it is as, as your mosaic of business? I think um, in digital payments, the US is a developing country, not a developed uh, country. Um, so <clears throat> you go around different parts of the world, it's far more advanced than we are on um, uh, digital payments from a consumer. Now we, we do a lot of credit card, we mm -hmm. do a lot of that, but mobile uh, payments, other parts of the world are far more advanced uh, than we are. Somebody once said to me, like, you know, you're moving into China, are you worried about your IP and stuff? And I was like, I'm like taking all that IP this way. Um, 
uh, that we're learning from being over there um, because they really are quite advanced, maybe the most advanced uh, country in the world in terms of uh, digital payments. But I think, I think the US uh, retail will drive the move to digital payments here because there is no question that most retailers uh, think of Amazon as an existential threat uh, to them. I think when Amazon bought Whole Foods, it was a Pearl Harbor moment for the retail industry. I mean, it's the first time everyone knew that uh, uh, in-store and online were coming together through the mobile phone. But most retailers thought about e-commerce over here and in-store over here. And you can't do that anymore with mobile. And I think Amazon's move into Whole Foods really was a, was a real a punch and a wake-up call. And um, so we're working with almost every major retailer right now. They're thinking about how do they use the PayPal platform as sort of the operating system for digital commerce as they write their app on top of our platform. Uh, to be able to compete against some of the uh, digital giants out um, there. Look, I, I'm glad you brought up Amazon because obviously. I brought it up for you, Joe. Thank you yeah, very you're much. Right. I fear <laughs> yeah, there's no good that again. I, mean, I, I think you didn't want to that question coming, so I thought I would like, <laughs> give it to you. <laughs> you watch the yeah. clock and you yeah, wait. Yeah, I know. I like, <laughs> That's the, 23 but, minutes. But you are such a I, gent. Wait. So, okay, so the stock goes down 10% because Amazon's going to give discounts. It goes down 10%. All right, well, it goes from 77 to 73 and then back, yeah, okay. bouncing around. That's 4%. Um, and yeah. for all I know, you were okay. in there buying back the stock <laughs> every single way because you got the biggest buyback as a percentage of of daily volume that I've seen in the first quarter. So you know that, that there was one piece of research that came out that maybe it was actually positive for you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I thought that was very interesting because I wanted to ask you, because to me, anytime the death star decides to go against you, it doesn't matter. It's going to hurt your margins. It could hurt your business. But I think that the one thing that they are, uh, that they unite is every other retailer gets hurt. And that I don't know whether a few percent of BIPs is enough to make it so that everybody wants to suddenly be with Amazon. Uh, yeah, so um, I have a couple of things to say about that. Um, so first, I mean, I don't think that competition is really anything new to us. Like right. The day I started at PayPal was the day Apple Pay uh, was announced. Um, so since then, we've put on 80 million when new subscribers, our transactions have grown, I don't know, something like eight or nine per a new coming in. Our net new actives are up by a double. Um, our revenues hit an all-time high in terms of growth, 24% last quarter. Our margins hit an all-time high last quarter um, as well. Um, and I think there are three reasons why that happens. First of all, we operate and we're fortunate in this. And I tell my team this all the time. Don't believe too much that's said about you or written about you because we're fortunate to operate in a very um, uh, fast growing industry, which is digital payments. I think one of the people up here said, you know, e-commerce is growing at 14 or 15 percent. Digital payments is growing faster than that. And that's the industry that we operate in. And so, you know, you, you just have to set your sails the right way to catch, you know, a reasonably good win. And, and we operate in a $100 trillion TAM, uh, you know, uh, addressable market. We're probably less than 1% market share of what our addressable market is. So it, it's not surprising there are competitors in there and there's so much room. And, no one company is going to own digital payments. That's, okay. that's for sure. Number two, we're now an open platform. So as a result, we're working hand in hand with the largest tech players in the world, whether it be Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Alibaba, Baidu. You go around the world, the largest uh, wireless carriers, Voda, uh, American Mobile, um, they all use our platform. Mm -hmm to run uh, their digital payments. The financial institutions are using the PayPal platform now uh, and encouraging, like I would never believe this two years ago, 
actually incenting their customers, giving $25 acquisitions for them to link their card into PayPal. Why? Because we drive so much growth uh, to them when that happens. So, so the competitive environment actually for us now is more benign than it was uh, two years ago. And I think that's just going to continue going forward. And finally, number three is we do have a great value proposition, and we do own our value proposition end to end. So we are an acquiring business, merchant acquiring right. business, or a consumer acquiring business. We do the networking in between. We have, we'll do something like 10 billion transactions uh, this year uh, on the platform, uh, over half a trillion dollars uh, on the platform. And uh, there's a huge amount of data we can mine and uh, increase our value proposition. And so I think um, we're not uh, monolithic in terms of just offering a button. We offer working capital, credit, rewards integration, contextual commerce tools, risk as a service, you name it. It's much more than what the typical consumer might think right. of uh, as PayPal. And so um, I think as long as we... Um, continue focusing on what retailers need, uh, focusing on what consumers need, uh, delivering against that, I think we'll continue to do well. And I think the final point on the Amazon side is most retailers view Amazon as their, their threat, not as their friend. Um, they're somewhat loath to give their data to Amazon mm -hmm. for fear that they'll shift their algorithm or whatever it may be. And so for almost all the ecosystem outside of, uh, of Amazon, PayPal is the platform uh, that they use. And I like our position on that. 100 million Prime members doesn't make you think, well, wait a second, they could flick, flick a switch and cut us out. I think um, to be successful um, as a payment uh, ecosystem um, is very hard. It's very hard because you need to have a two-sided network. Um, and that means you have to have a critical mass of merchants. We have 19 million merchants on our platform, growing at almost a million a quarter in terms of merchants. Um, Amazon has a total of 2 million on the platform, total. Um, and that's over X number of years that they've done that. We're putting on a million a quarter or so. Um, and so consumers want to shop. Um, they don't want to use stuff that they, where they go to a retailer and, the, and they can't shop there mm -hmm. and they don't use that. So you need to have a critical mass of consumers and a critical mass of merchants come together. So we have, let's call it in round numbers, 220 million consumers, 20 million round numbers, 20 million merchants, almost 240 million people on the platform um, growing at you know, for the last three quarters, over 8 million every, uh, uh, every quarter. So uh, I never, ever uh, downplay what any competitor is doing. Uh, I think we have a healthy degree of paranoia. But to me, competition is a little like gravity. Like, I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and goes, oh, gravity is pulling me down today. You know, I could jump 20 feet uh, if there wasn't gravity. There's always competition around, always. Um, and the people who win in this are people who have um, scale, people who have the right assets, people who have the, uh, the right team around them, and people that focus more than anything else on being a customer champion, on doing the right thing for various segments of the market um, and putting out innovation and value uh, consistently. And so we won't be the only player out there, but. I like our hand, and I like uh, the industry that we're working in. The, uh, the other parlor game that's being played about your stock is to try to figure out how badly you'll be hit by uh, eBay separation. J.P. Morgan puts out this note just a few weeks ago, 35 cent headwind from fiscal year 2020 to 2022. Uh, it's a little like uh, I'm not going to get into how much it's like Elon Musk, how much are they going to need to raise? I, I don't want to do that. I want to talk about something that you haven't that no one's talked about, okay. the advantages of not being the partner to eBay? Yeah. So first of all, um, on eBay, um, we put into place a five-year operating agreement 
I put it into place with Devin Wenick, who's the CEO of uh, who's your friend of eBay, who's a very close right. friend of mine. Um, and in that five years, we basically said to ourselves, okay, we're separating our two companies. Um, it's a massive separation. We've been part of eBay for 12 years. Every all of our data systems are integrated. Everything's integrated. So we've got to figure out. One, how are we going to separate? And then two, how are we going to um, have a runway for a manageable transition to two full independent companies? So everything that eBay is doing and everything that we are doing was all outlined in the operating agreement. So for us, like we, like maybe we didn't do as good a job as we should have in terms of talking about it. Um, but for us, all of that has always been part of our guidance part of our plans. There was nothing unexpected uh, in that. And so, um, and Devin and I like, had lunch a couple of weeks ago and we're like, I did, not, did no one read the operating agreement? Um, so, um, so here's what happened. So they get to um, have another uh, uh, underlying payment provider, right. um, which by the way, every single marketplace in the world does, has at least two. I mean, it's the only the right thing for eBay mm -hmm. to have that. But we were prevented during those five years from working with their largest competitors um, as well. And they detailed those. They were redacted uh, in the operating agreement, but they detailed those out. And you can imagine who they might be. Right. Um, and um, so at the end of the operating agreement, we have the opportunity to work with them. And those marketplaces are, some of them are, one to two times larger uh, than eBay, uh, growing at 50% year over year. eBay's growing at about 5%. Yep, 5%. So we're very excited. And you heard me on the last uh, call say, like we've had direct conversations with all of them. And many of them are very excited about deepening their relationship with us. And you know, we'll, we'll talk more about that um, as you know, over the next six to 12 months as we can. But that operating agreement runs for another, through July of 2020. Right. And, uh, and post that, um, we'll be able to make a definitive announcement. But they're allowed to do what, a couple countries? Yeah, they're allowed to do up to 5%. Right, and yeah. uh, is it in their interest to try to tout how well those countries are doing? I think um, they want to. Uh, Sure, and we're going to help them, by the way. I mean, remember, we just signed a new agreement right. with eBay as well that goes through July 2023, uh, so another five years uh, to work hand-in-hand -hand with eBay. And I would, I would like, if we were betting uh, people, and, and we are, you and I, um, you know, I'd bet that we're going to be very close partners with eBay for a long time. Why is that? It's because their customers want PayPal. Every one of those small businesses has integrated PayPal into their back office systems. They don't want to separate out. Um, and you know, as eBay wants to move into payments, they need PayPal. And we want to be a part of eBay and be a very close partner with them, and we will be. OK, uh, as preparation for our interchange, I sat down with Michelle Moore, who is a very able exec in charge of digital banking at Bank of America. And she is telling me, listen, uh, Jim, you so are, you're so high on Venmo. Of course, I'm high on Venmo because my kids are Venmo. They, they don't know right. anything other than Venmo. They, they told me about the verb. Uh, you're so high on Venmo, but you haven't looked at Zelle enough. Zelle is big. Uh, Zelle can disrupt any possible plans to monetize Venmo. And I said, okay, that's interesting. Can they? I think um, uh, Venmo um, has kind of gone from strength to strength. Last quarter, Venmo had its best net new active quarter ever. Um, in its history. Um, we're on a run rate right now to do over $50 billion in volume on Venmo. Uh, last quarter, it grew over 80% uh, year over year. Um, and um, it is fundamentally different than Zelle. Okay. Uh, Zelle's average transaction size is about 300 to $350. It's infrequent, it's about once a month um, is its use case. Venmo, uh, people open the Venmo app uh, four to six times a week. Um, their average transaction is 40 to $50. 
Um, so it's a radically different segment of the population. And if you know Venmo, and I'm gonna look around. I, I'm always able to tell exactly who uses Venmo, by the way. <laughs> like when I was doing analyst meetings so like for, and prep for the IPO, I could predict it with like 95% <laughs> accuracy. But I won't do it here. Won't do that. You're very yeah. nice. Yeah, I won't, but I can predict it. Um, but in that millennial population, um, it is the way that they manage right. and move money. It is what they do with their friends. 94% of all Venmo transactions are tagged uh, in some way with emojis or commentary. Um, you can turn that on or off. Most keep it on. It's posted into their uh, Facebook uh, posts. Um, it, by the way, although 94% are tagged, about 67% of those are in code. So you would not know what it, what it means. Your friends know what it means, but, but others who look uh, don't know uh, what it means. So it's really a social payments mm -hmm. uh, platform. And um, I'm actually pretty thrilled right now with our uh, early efforts to monetize it. Because when we monetize it, people tend to think about, OK, well, you're monetizing it. Is that really going to be good for subscribers? Right. The way we're monetizing it is giving more capabilities, uh, more functionality to the Venmo user. Um, but those things are like access to PayPal merchants okay. um, and um, the ability to get instant cash out which comes at a fee of 25 cents, but before they uh, would have to wait two to three days uh, mm -hmm. to get that money out. And so the best metaphor for the monetization of Venmo, and the reason why I'm so confident about it, is PayPal. PayPal started as a P2P service. Um, then it went into merchants, predominantly on eBay, and then now you know, 87% plus of our volume comes outside of those eBay merchants. Venmo will be exactly the same way, uh, but probably better because we've learned a lot right. uh, over the time since we did PayPal. You know, uh, we had the, uh, <laughs> the holiday party for Squawk on the street, and you had to, it, was, it came to a certain amount, and uh, it, uh, Kayla Talshi, nice, terrific younger person for our, on our staff, was in charge of collecting yeah. the money, and I was the only person who wrote a check. <laughs> the only person. One check. Yeah, nobody wants a check. Yeah. Nobody wants a check. <laughs> okay, so. By the way, what's really interesting is, I, I just heard this the other day. In Florida, okay, which is not like, you know, Venmo country. Um, <laughs> so, um, but in Florida now, grandparents, grandparents, you know, they send like, they send checks right. or cash in the mail to their kids or whatever, grandkids. Um, and what's happening is there's actually been a lot of theft uh, that's gone on with that. And so the kids are telling now their grandparents to use Venmo. And so we're now actually weirdly seeing a increase in that population. And it's, it used to be us driving things for our kids, but it's now the other way around because that's really Gen Tech, and they are, they know that all of you are their bank accounts, really, um, and they want you to sign up for uh, Venmo uh, so that you can fund them. But you worked at American Express. Uh, when I got out of college, the, my father told me, listen, you've made it when you become a member. I'm a member since 1980. Membership has its privileges. My kids don't know what it is. They, they don't. They are millennials, and uh, you worked at American Express. Did American Express, does anyone, did anyone see it coming? Because I don't think the millennials are, are that interested in having a traditional credit card. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's any lack of awareness uh, of that. Um, I, think, I think there are two different ways of thinking about facts. One is you can intellectualize facts. And then one is you feel it in your gut, in your heart, in your soul. And that change, right? The, mm -hmm. Like, let's, let's face it. Credit cards, let me take time out of the equation so that people don't like debate me on this. Like, um, 20 years from now, there will be no more credit cards, really, 
right? I mean, why would you have them per se when you can just do a QR code or an NFC tap, et cetera, and you'll get so much more value because it's done through a, through a mobile device. And everybody will have a smartphone. Everyone will have a smartphone. I'm on the board of Flex. Um, I know what we forward price those smartphones on. And, and in India, you can get a smartphone now for under $25. It's gonna, it's basically, you're gonna have full connectivity of smartphones you're gonna have at a very low price. And so the manifestation of that credit card, there'll still be a funding instrument behind the tap, but it changes. So if your value proposition is colors of a card, that's probably not a great value proposition going forward um, because the card is going to be um, uh, taken out of the system and put into the, mo into the mobile phone. Now you may have artwork in the, in the phone and we allow uh, full renditioning of what that card looks like inside our wallet. But really it's gonna be what is the value proposition for using a particular funding instrument or another instrument. Um, so I think um, what all of us need to be thinking about is really what is the value add that we add in, in a new world mm -hmm. dominated by mobile, dominated by mobile. And I know everyone talks about mobile, but I don't think we can overemphasize the change that mobile is gonna have on retail, the change that it's gonna have in financial services. It's already having changes on entertainment, uh, publishing, um, and I mean, not all of you live, you know, your lives every single day like I do in the in the tech sphere, but you look at the changes that are going to happen in processing with quantum coming on. So quantum, I'll give you the best way of thinking about quantum. And quantum's the next ten to fifteen years where it comes in. A qubit, which is what you measure processing power in in quantum, a qubit is the equivalent of one quadrillion quadrillion, a trillion trillion, one quadrillion transistors on a chip. Okay, today we're at about a little over a billion on a chip. In 1981, when IBM introduced the first PC, there were 27,000 transistors on a chip. So we're going to a quadrillion, quadrillion, the equivalent. Now it's not the same because it's not ones and zeros, et cetera, it's very different. And then you got AI coming on board and AI today is specific. It means that we do general tasks with, with our machines, simultaneous language translation, uh, teaching it how to beat a grandmaster at chess or at Go. But in the next 10 to 15 years, and let's say 15 years, we go to general. General is where a machine simulates the cognitive functionality of a human brain. And it will be very different. Difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish between machine and a person in 15 years plus. So you have processing power that is gonna be uh, like something out of science fiction, which by the way, can crack any crypto that we have today in under a second when you're at that kind of processing speed. Just to, people should be thinking about that already. You have AI coming and then we have this huge amount of data that we all leave in our wake right now. There are over 500 million tweets a day, like most by our president, I think. Um, <laughs> but, um, besides that, um, you've got uh, six and a half billion uh, Google searches a day. Facebook has the equivalent of 126 books of digital information on every single subscriber. You know, for those of you who use Tinder, I'm looking, no, not many. Uh, but Tinder has 1.4 billion swipes a day on it, 1.4 billion. So there is so much data and information in the world and processing power that's going exponentially and intelligence going this way that things are gonna change dramatically and thinking about what our value propositions look like in that world going forward and um, I think is incumbent on any company and any leader 
uh, to go and do. Okay, no, I'm going to just front a little bit long because it's, I find this fascinating, and I think everybody does. And this is I'm learning more than I have in a long time. I'm talking to you, Dan. Uh, but I hear artificial intelligence, and I think, okay, how, is Alexa a threat to you? Is uh, Erica, uh, Bank of America's... Uh, Erica? Well, <laughs> well, it's what they're telling me is big. Okay, all right. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it is. They told me that. I thought Veronica was, but okay. <laughs> well, I think that answers whether Eric is a threat, but <laughs> Alexa. Yeah. Well, I do think um, we're going to have just another thing that uh, just threw out there is so we have five and a half billion smartphones today in the world. We'll have in the next, by 2025. We'll have 100 billion, 100 billion Internet of Thing devices okay. put on. Nanny cams, light bulbs, refrigerators, washing machines. So 100 billion of those out there. The mean time to attack for cyber, for, uh, for when an Internet of Thing is connected to the Internet, is two minutes. That's the mean time to attack uh, when a... IOT is put onto a, uh, into the network. And so we really need to start thinking about uh, all of these devices. Mm -hmm. And by the way, each of those devices, 15 years from now, will have the size of uh, a human brain in them, the size of a grain of salt. All of them will, because they collect information, and 85% of the world's information is worthless after three minutes. So we want real time data to be able to make decisions uh, on that. And so I think part of the reason, um, and we don't really talk about this that much, but part of the reason that we went to a platform and an open mm -hmm. platform that basically, as opposed to a product and a, and a button, is so that we can start to interface across all these different devices there through API. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll be integrated into Alexa, we'll be integra oh. we're integrated okay. into Siri already, and because we do have an open okay. platform to be able to go and do that. And I just point out, though, you can't think about Erica or Veronica or Hal or whoever is the next thing that's coming out there, unless you have a full open platform okay. to be able to go and do that. If you're doing things on a bespoke basis through bespoke customization of software, that's a very dangerous thing to do. And that's why like, we aren't a platform that just embraces NFC, right? We embrace NFC, we embrace uh, QR uh, codes um, will embrace um, uh, Samsung's sort of you know uh, radio frequency uh, that they have because we don't believe that um, a consumer or a merchant wants to just be obligated to a certain platform or operating system or POS technology that it needs to be uh, agnostic to that and neutral and that really is how we're trying to build our platform in anticipation of all these things that are going to happen. For instance, we're thinking about blockchain. Most people think about blockchain around crypto. Right. We can talk about that if you want to, even though we have zero time. Yep. Um, but, um, and it's a, it's a really fascinating conversation to really understand what blockchain and crypto is, um, because most people don't understand it. But we're thinking about blockchain uh, more around identity uh, management, mm -hmm. because in because you now have your identity spread among different um, uh, pieces of, of the ledger. Mm -hmm. And then really only through a key can you bring them together. It's a much safer than just username and password. Like username and password isn't even a defense system anymore. Right. Every two seconds, a consumer's identity is stolen. Every two seconds. So, so you may be a PayPal customer. And she logs in with your identity. It's real. It's actually your name and your password. And she has it. She just mentioned, which I thought she did, because I saw you on the dark web the other day. Um, and um, what we need to do, what we need to do is not pay attention to that username and password. That's like defense number one of like 30. We actually need to see, are you acting like he always did act? in the same place as he is, a number of other things that I won't say out loud because um, any bad guy will take any piece of information I give and try and use it uh, on it. But we basically look at 30 different 
identifiers on every transaction to be sure beyond username password, which like 987 million stolen last year. So it's not a great defense system to be sure that it's you making the transaction and we can stop fraudulent uh, behavior from happening on the on the platform. Right, now, I, I'm not going to be rude. So I was going to. I had like another ten questions, but I'm not going to do that. I am going to do this though. I was going to ask you about why you don't talk more about Braintree specifically. I was going to talk about return on PayPal, which just came up on our on our cell phones today. But I do want to ask about crypto because Square always tells me, and Sarah Fryer's terrific. She always says, "Oh, listen, if the get if the uh, customers want crypto." If they want, you know, whatever they want, Ethereum, we'll give them Ethereum. It doesn't matter. How are you feeling on that? And that will be my last question because I'm not going to hog any more time. Bitcoin, Ethereum, which at Ripple, yeah, yeah, Ripple, whatever. RMX, whatever. Uh, there's so many of them. Right. Uh, Litecoin. Um, so I think the first thing to understand is what was the objective of these cryptos? Um, the objective of the initial uh, folks who wrote blockchain was to embed a different protocol into the internet. That was their objective. And cryptocurrencies were the reward mechanism for miners to embed that protocol. Okay, just think of crypto as a as one application on top of blockchain, but it was the important first one because who's actually going to embed a new protocol without being rewarded for it? And the idea of the new protocol, today the internet runs on TCP IP. TCP IP is basically the traffic cop protocol of the internet. You put in a certain URL, it tells you where to go, it get, gives information back, and that's the dominant protocol. Blockchain is a distributed trust protocol, and basically what that allows you to do as an individual is to keep your identity, to keep your preferences, that kind of thing to yourself as opposed to ceding them to corporations or governments uh, in terms of who controls your information. It was a very utopian um, a view of, of the internet going forward. That's what blockchain was really about, a utopian view of the internet that gives power back to the consumer and it's very hard to embed protocol, new protocol into the internet. And so you needed to have these cryptos on top that were limited, blockchain, right, at 21 million, mm -hmm. um, so that early adopters would get disproportionately rewarded for implementing the uh, protocol um, that goes on. So it may very well be that blockchain gets embedded in the internet as a new protocol because of these cryptos, but that cryptos all go away, that there isn't crypto on top of it, because it's a reward mechanism. Now, by the way, there are some other things you might be able to do with it. But crypto today, crypto today is an incredibly volatile currency. There are no retailers that accept crypto, none. The reason is that they have such a small margin, and the cryptocurrency goes up and down each day so that if they accepted it, they could lose money on every one of those transactions easily. So the only merchants that accept it are really on the dark web right now. And I don't encourage any of you to go on the dark web because you can't ever unsee what you see on that. Um, and um, you know, I'm the chairman of the board of Symantec, so I, I know a lot about the security side of this, which is why I, I, I am there, not for any other reason, I might add. Um, but. Um, but I would just say they're the only ones who do it because of the anonymous nature of, uh, of crypto. But I wouldn't be so totally confident that it's anonymous um, on that. But, but no merchant wants it. And almost every consumer is doing it as uh, trades, uh, as commodity, as uh, speculation right now. None of them are using it as a currency. And I say none. You know, Maybe it's like 1%. But it's good enough to say none uh, right now. So from our perspective, and we're a little different this way, sure, consumers could want to trade in Ethereum or whatever, but they're mostly doing it under speculation, and most of them are doing it without perfect information. And we don't want to be a part of it. We don't want to be a part of a consumer losing a tremendous amount of money. And a lot of them are fraudulent stuff that's going on. Um, and so 
our, we allow somebody to um, take from Coinbase and put it into, mm -hmm. our, into our wallet once they've translated it into fiat currency. But we're not going to help um, mostly scammers hurt consumers uh, around this. We are big believers in blockchain. I think blockchain could be revolutionary. Um, and we are, uh, we understand what crypto is for. Mm -hmm. And we'll see where crypto goes. There may be some use mechanisms for it in like international remittances and other things. But, um, but I think if you understand what it's really there to go do, and then you really understand how blockchain can uh, reformulate new applications, um, then you know what some of the where the power is and where the hype is. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Dan Schulman, CEO. Hey.